Hello everybody, it is Tim here with Tabletop Terrors, and this is Daily Damage. This is a live stream most weekdays that we do here on Facebook, and then we try to put them on YouTube. And so, uh, I'm doing a classic Daily Damage where I'm going to be driving, so I'm not going to be able to look at the chat right away, uh, but I'm on my way home. I think we're going to do like a cool family uh, dinner night. Not sure where we're going to go yet. Um, in fact, maybe I'll ask uh, James and Cassie if they want to join us. Just something fun and relaxed. But typically, I start the stream with something that I call the rundown. And the rundown is just some stuff that you might be interested in that you might want to check out. Uh, and that's while the video is sharing a lot of times. It takes 15 to 20 seconds to kind of get kicking. So... For the rundown, the first thing I'm going to say is this Sunday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern on the Tabletop Terrors YouTube channel, we're going to have Sean, Sean, the Dungeon Master of the article, 70-year-olds play D&D and love it. You can check that article out on tabletopterrors.com. And we're going to be interviewing him and talking to him more about the 70-year-olds that play D&D and love it. Um, that article uh, struck a chord with a lot of people, and uh, so we thought it would be great to interview Sean and see what was going on there. If you tried to go to tabletopterror.com today, uh, there was a big DDoS attack So on the East Coast, so there was a lot of outages to a lot of sites. Um, thank you to the people that messaged us, but it was totally outside of our control. Uh, I, from what I understand, it's working again, so you can check out that article uh, now. Uh, in fact, I was going to say, there was something else uh, that I was very surprised to learn. A lot of the emails that people were sending us through the Tabletop Terrors website, for whatever reason, they were dumping into the main inbox of uh, Gmail. They weren't going into the normal inbox. They were going into the all mail folder, which is kind of tough to... I didn't realize that. So I, I was just... I happened to do a search for a, a word and found several of these emails and I was like, oh my gosh. So I found a bunch. So if you got a reply for me today, that's what it's about. Um, so the topic of today is really just saying, well, how do you run mazes in a theater of the mind game? And this actually came from someone who emailed us on the website. That's what made me think of actually running this. Um, it was David. So David... Uh, I emailed him a response, but it started getting me thinking. I'm like, how would I run a maze? Especially because I play a lot of games online. And so, I think mazes in general, unless you're in person or if your group is very map heavy, you've got someone who's the cartographer who's drawing room by room, uh, then these can be pretty tricky. Because you need to know where you are in a maze, specifically if you want them to solve it very methodically. If you want it to be a visual puzzle where they can see sort of the outline, almost like one of those mazes you would do in the newspaper, like where you can, you know, basically you try to find the way out. If you want them to play like that and treat it like a puzzle, that's one way to do it. Um, but I had this concept and I wanted to bounce it off of everybody because I want to know uh, what you think of it. And I will go to the chat here soon at a red light. I know that there's a few people watching here. But I wanted to throw this out there because I think this could play well. I think this could actually be an interesting kind of way to do it. So, the maze starts out. So it's like, you're my players, I set things up, I explain to you that you're in a maze, you kind of get that idea. The maze is a certain number of rooms of successful checks. In other words, it's this big maze, okay? But we're going to make things a little more nebulous. We're going to make things a little more fluid on purpose. So I'm not saying when you walk through six rooms, you're at the end of the maze. What I'm saying is how you do when you leave each room on these skill checks dictates whether or not you get to go successfully closer through one of these, I don't know, we'll call them core rooms, six core rooms. So it starts out, I'm like, all right, there are six core rooms in the maze. So here's what I mean. The first room, 
I would throw an encounter in there. And this can be any counter. You can use your five room dungeon set up here where the first one's an entrance or guardian. Um, you know, you've got role play encounters, puzzles and traps, that kind of thing. But when the players go to leave the room, they have to make some checks to do this. Now, you can let them be creative, okay? You can let them, and depending on the flavor of the maze that you want to run, these can be, you know, survival checks. These can be investigation checks. I think it would be good to make sure that there's enough variety so that you're not getting your entire group stuck. So, what happens? Well, I think you should use group checks. And if you never use group checks, I think it's page, it's in the 170s. Page, page 175, I think, of the player's handbook has the group check rules. And what that means is the whole group rolls. And if half or more of the group passes, then the whole group passes. So I think this could kind of be fun too, to use group checks, where you know, choose one, like, alright, let's choose a, you know, a wisdom survival role to kind of go. Now, here's what happens. It's a very simple DC to start with. It's a DC 11. You're thinking, well, what? That sounds kind of easy. Well, you want it to be kind of easy at first. So, this is what happens. They, they roll, oh, we got it. Alright, so they move from one core room to the next core room. Alright, and I'm going to park here. I just got out of my neighborhood, but park so I can finish this. Now, so here's the idea. Um, once they leave a room, they make that skill check, the DC 11, to find the correct way to the next room. If they fail, you add another core room, and you add plus one to the DC. So now, they're in one, there were six total, now they're seven core rooms away from finding the end of the maze, and the DC just went up to a 12. So... They're doing this thing, they're doing this thing, and then they, don't forget, there are encounters in between here, so they're doing their thing. You know, combats, uh, role-play encounters, other puzzles and challenges. And then from there, I'm doing this all theater of the mind, because I can narrate, like, okay, you go on for another hour, and uh, it seems like you're kind of back where you started from. And it's like, ah. Uh. So now as a game master, I know, okay, they have seven core rooms that they need to, you know, kind of find their way through. But as they do this, if they fail a few times, you're talking now there's eight core rooms before they're at the end of the maze and the DC check is a 15. They could literally get lost forever. Um, because by the time it, it could, you know, torque up to like a DC 18 and they're 20 rooms away. I mean, you know, that's pretty drastic. Now, I would probably do this as a one shot, but think about it. The players would have to get very creative. They'd have to be um, just thinking on their feet, and I love the idea that it would feel like they're getting deeper and deeper into this maze. That's what I loved about this concept. So, uh, Let's check the chat here. Dustin is here. What's up? Matthew Knapp is here. What is going on? Dustin says, how you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm getting ready to start my weekend, and I'm feeling great about it. John is here. Andre Martinez of the RPG Brigade is here. Um, in fact, we just sent out a 5 Crit Friday Plugging Brigade Con, that went out today at around 1 o'clock, and one of the things you shouldn't miss, uh, it went out as an event we won't miss, and Brigade Con was in there. So if you haven't checked your inbox, number one, go check your inbox for 5 Crit Friday, the inspiration we sent. I'm actually, I was really happy with the, the links we sent out this week. Uh, some, some pretty cool stuff in there. And uh, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, it's our e-newsletter. We send out just small links of inspiration. The best way to sign up for that is on tabletopterrors.com. Uh, on the left-hand side, um, and I can also probably link it somewhere in this video. Um, but check out BrigadeCon.org to sign up for BrigadeCon. So, uh, let's see who else is here. Jonathan Lutzer. Hi, Tim. You seem to have much better weather than I do right now. I just defrosted from a five-mile run in the frigid rain. Uh, the weather is gorgeous right now. It is picturesque, is how I describe it. And John says... Hey, Tim, I had the tabletop terrorist theme stuck in my head all day at work. Good, man. I uh, We made sure to include that in a video that we did. We did a channel invasion where we flip-flopped uh, videos with Drunkens and Dragons. And so we did a video for their channel. He did a video for our channel, and he killed it. It was great. But we made sure to put our theme song at the end because we wanted people to know, like, hey, you got to hear this theme song. 
Chris Wilhelm and John Getz are here. Ethan Hull says, jealous of the weather, getting rain down here in eastern PA. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Like, the sun is just beaming. I pulled into my neighborhood. I'm behind some trees, and the clouds are covering the sun right now. Jonathan Lutzer, I love mazes, but not maps. I'm looking forward to this. Hopefully, this is making sense. Hopefully, this is kind of, you know, going well for you. Let me know what you think, Jonathan. Chris Willem says, I did a flow chart in my Dragon Grin free venture. Basically, each branch is a path. Each path has checks for monsters or a combo. The rooms also have descriptions, and it even allows me to have them double back. He put a link there. The free venture initiative is something that Drop Dice is doing, where he's basically just writing and giving away free adventures, and uh, which is super rad of him. And they're great. They're really well done. So um, check out the link here, and I'll also pull that link from the chat, and I'll put it into this video description when I put this video on YouTube. Jonathan Lester says, oh, sounds fun, Chris. Matthew Knapp says, L-O. Stephen back joined. What's going on? So I want to know everybody's thoughts on that to kind of catch up again. This is to make the maze feel real. This is to make the maze feel like it's something that the players can actually get lost in. Not, well, my game master has this planned out, so okay, hey, all right. Wh where's the part where we find the end? And it's like, no, you can really get lost in here. Like, you absolutely can get lost in here. If you want to go super hard in the paint, throw a minotaur in there. Good old-fashioned, classic minotaur. If that's too tropey for you, reskin a minotaur to be... Uh, Demogorgon from Stranger Things or um, something, uh, you know, ghastly or an aberration or even just a good old-fashioned feral beast like a starving wolf. Something that would just be chasing the players down. But I like the idea that this thing has an opportunity to catch the players. And you can even give it, you know, throw a timer on there, Drunkens and Dragons style, make it so that, you know, every two rooms that the players miss the check for you roll a d4 or a d6 it's like a recharge where it's like you roll a d6 and on a five or a six the monster appears um i just i just think that would be a really fun one shot it would be i think a heavy sense of tension and i think it would be fun to run i, I think i might try to run that steven back says sup tim walking through the wally world it's a maze of its own dude no kidding they actually um we were just at toys r us uh, my daughter's been really, really well behaved, and she's being potty trained, and so we wanted to uh, get her a toy. And uh, they just reset the entire Toys R Us, and I'd only been there once. So I walked in, I was like, oh, I want to get her the... I swear this was just different. And my wife was like, are you sure? And I'm like, no, I'm telling you, this was here, and this was here. And we ran into an employee who was like, yeah, we just reset the whole thing. So that actually is something else, too, is that kind of borrowing from the labyrinth, if you really want to mess with them, just for flavor, you can talk about how the walls are moving or how things are flipping and switching. And, you know, in the labyrinth, uh, the main character was drawing little arrows so she knew which way to go. But uh, forces outside of her control were turning cobblestone so that the arrows were spinning and moving. So I think that's kind of a cool layer to add on there as well. Make it so that there are denizens of the maze that know where they're going. And they're not necessarily hostile toward the players, but they're maybe mischievous or uh, not even indifferent. They're either mischievous or just sort of like, ugh, like, what are you doing here? Like, just messing with them, not helping, stuff like that. That would be good for role playing. Alex Brady's here. So Jonathan Lutzer says, yes, it makes sense in principle. I want an alternative to the potential to be eternally lost, though. I see the benefits of it, but I do have to spend time with my players every day. Listen, um, uh, come up with whatever you think would be an alternative to that. I like the idea between you and me, don't tell them this. I want them to feel eternally lost. I'm not saying I'm definitely going to do that. What I would probably do is as they're feeling the most hopeless, as things are getting like worse and worse and worse, and as they fail this a few times, and this minotaur or this, you know, dire wolf, this whatever, the demogorgon's coming up on them, they're following, they're grinding away, and, uh, and then bring someone or something back from earlier in the campaign, or if it's a one-shot, you can plant a seed, plant a couple of Chekhov's guns on the wall early, that you can kind of pull back, like one of the, you know, Snurf, 
Sverf Neblin help them, but now they're indebted to the players. Like that kind of thing. You know, in other words, give them an out, but now that it's at a cost. Uh, or, this would be even crazier, have the thing, the crazy thing, catch up with them, and then not want to hurt them. It actually catches up with them because of X reason, like, hey, you have to get out of here. Something crazy. Um, so anyway, that's what I would do. Make them feel like they're going to be eternally lost, even though they're not, and then just pull something from the beginning of the adventure or previous in the campaign. This would be a great time for Han Solo to show up and, you know, blow up a couple TIE Fighters so that Luke can blow up the Death Star. You know what I'm saying? Because Willem says, I like the idea of adding the extra room as they fail, plus it makes the dungeon feel real. They have past empty or an important room, then bam, an important room with something of note. Exactly that, Chris. I really like the idea. I think I'm going to try to make this into a very simple... Um, encounter, or not encounter, but like a, an adventure template where it's just maze stuff out here. Chris Willem says, I might put a cap on the room so that it doesn't go on forever, maybe 10 rooms or so. That's actually a really good point. Um, put a cap on it, and also you can kind of feel it out and just be like, okay, they feel they feel lost and, and like they're going to die. I'm going to cap it right here. But again, you have to keep this cap up here. Don't tell them like, alright, well it's a 10, so it's capped off. Make them feel like they're totally lost. Make them feel like they can't win and they can't get further. So that's that. That's how I would handle. All right, let's see here. John Getz says once in second edition, I did a classic tesseract and I made a color coded flowcharts to keep all eight rooms straight, even though they were identical. That's baller. That's really cool. Um, I would really try to look at running that online and and. That would be cool. That's actually a really, maybe like, that would be the sequel. So if this was like, you know, I know this is not a thing that I should use because it's, I think it's actually the name of a module. But if this was like Mazes of Madness, then the Tesseract would be Mazes of Madness 2, Tesseract of Doom, like something like that. Alex Brady says, such an interesting subject. I always play theater of the mind and I've never done a maze encounter before. I'm eager to hear your take on how that would work. I'm going to try this. Uh, I am going to try this. I think this is actually going to be something that would be pretty cool. Jonathan Lutzer. There's a book I read where the maze was a house where only the room the characters were in had light. There were panels next to each door with three arrows. One green, one red, one squiggly, and the squiggly arrows pointed to the correct door. That was one of my favorite scenes in the book. Also, thanks for the advice about not being trapped going in circles forever. Totally. Rob Coletta. Tim, I'm about to run my first one-shot based around the Magisterium. How do you handle the short story format in D&D? &D? Um, honestly, just make sure you don't try to cram too much in. That's the number one thing. Cut about half of what you have in your head because the players are only going to get halfway through what you have planned, in my experience. So you have to keep it very, very lean. A one shot has to be a beginning, a middle, and an end in the time it takes to do one act of a normal uh, campaign. So... Uh, to me, for instance, if you look at the Season 2 game we played of the Provokers, Session 1 is just a setup. It's just a setup. That would not have worked so well as a one-shot. So there has to be uh, a clear, I think, beginning, middle, and then payoff, maybe cliffhanger. But I would say if you have, oh, I've got these five things planned. Nope, cut it down. Have one major combat one major role play encounter and then some touchstones because you can always add more in but it's really difficult if you plan for them to get through all of it and they don't so that would be my thought process with a one shot as far as keeping it in the, sh the short story format the other thing is if you plan on playing these characters again that's one thing but if this is a one shot that's supposed to feel like a singleness of effect Edgar Allan Poe story don't be afraid to kill characters um, don't be afraid to put them in terrible, uh, treacherous, sort of impossible situations, and because that can feel awful, like tragedy, but it's like really, it'll resonate with the players for a long time, they'll always talk about that game where they got trapped out at sea and drowned, like stuff like that. Now I'm not saying kill all the players, but I would say I, my lethality in one shots definitely goes up. Um, an example of a game that could work as a one shot, but is a campaign, and I absolutely 
absolutely want to continue this campaign we have time is look at the uh, Dead, Man, Dead Men of Dragon Grins campaign. Rob, the campaign that you started playing in, that could have worked as a one-shot. I could have ended it right there if I would have forced you guys to go outside. You know, or if something like that could have been the big turnaround, the big end. Instead of having uh, something that happened at the end that led into something else, it would be a big Twilight Zone-esque reveal. <sighs> the end. Short story over. Chris Wilhelm says, how about making it into the one of the Abtab Five Room Dungeons? Chris, that's exactly what I was going to do. Literally, that's exactly what I was going to do. The reason why I didn't mention that is because I thought if everyone hasn't seen the other stream, I'd have to kind of explain all that. So I'll do it in a very short version. We're thinking of coming up with these very short... I think we're even going to call it Dragon Grin Adventure Creation Kit. And it's just this map with five short descriptions of encounters and like, hey, here's what happens in this room. If you wanted to be role play, here's what could happen. Uh, here's a list of some hazards. Here's a list of, you know, we, so I think, Chris, this is actually a really good one. In fact, it might be the first or second one we do. Napkin Naps is a maze is also a great place to throw in puzzles that would help the players advance. Absolutely. That's actually a really clever way to do it. So um, we were asking, you know, we were talking before, like, well, how do I make it so they don't feel eternally lost? Well, the denizens of the, the maze or the minotaur or someone, if they don't have a an ability, a magical ability or some sort of power that lets them move through walls or go... They have to be able to traverse this this maze quickly and easily. So why don't we make it so that they realize toward the end, when they're lost as could be, that any of the, the walls that have a specific kind of torch or uh, something on it that just look like decoration is actually a puzzle. It's actually like the background inner workings of like tunnels that are much more clearly marked. Because I like to think that this maze was not just built to be confusing. It was built to confuse others by someone who built it. So they start noticing like, oh, wait, you notice. You realize that this wall is the same as the other three that you've found. Now, you have to be careful with that, though, because if they're very astute players, they might find that in the middle, and then they'll be like, what? I solved the puzzle shortcut. <laughs> so that's just one thing. Uh, Rob says, sorry, missed the topic. Oh, you're okay. Uh, Steven says, I made a ziggurat that was a maze. Four levels deep, and I used a digital battle map. I made the sections of a maze in photos, and photos hope and dropped them in as players decided to go that direction. Oh, Photoshop. So you're saying you basically, they say, I go this way, and you go, plunk. Totally. That makes perfect sense. Like a fog of war kind of thing. That's really clever. Um, that's why this, this theater of the mind style, this would be very figurative. It would be very, um, it wouldn't be a literal, like, you go in this room, and then you go in this room, and then you go in this room. It would be more like, based on their group check or based on their checks and how they do, uh, you just narrate, like, not just them going through the one room, but narrating one core room to the next core room would be something like, okay, and in about 30 or 40 minutes, you can't really tell exactly how long it's been. You find your way through a, you know, a cobweb-filled path that hasn't been walked through in a long time, but you recognize that there's torchlight. That's the other thing. I was going to say to make this, because it's a game and because I want this to be clear in the minds of the players, I would probably make a mechanic where the torchlight is brightest when they're on the right path, or something like that. I, you know, some kind of thing where, you know, because then it's like, well, I would just follow the brightest torches. Well, that's the point, is that the torches change from dim to bright, and things like that, as they're going through. So, I don't know, just find some way that you can cue them, like, hey, you're on the right path. Chris Wilhelm, I'm not saying kill all the players, I'm just saying trap them in a dungeon forever. Right. Exactly. Rob says, death to the players. Got it. You're the best. Got to bring Fade back in Dragon Grin. Yeah, man, I really do want to get back into that game. Uh, I think that's going to be one that we'll probably dig into uh, here in the new year. Uh, things will probably get a little more leveled out for me. Chris, can you do another video on how to do puzzles in Theater of the Mind? I have always done it with actual set pieces the players manipulated to solve. Sure. I'll try to dream something up. That's actually a good idea. Um... I think this would be a good little mini-series to do in Daily Damage, which is, you know, 
Puzzles in theater of the mind. Mazes in theater of the mind. Things that are tough to do unless you're uh, right there. So, yeah, I can definitely do that. Alex Brady. What would the motivation for someone in the campaign be to spend time and resources to build a maze rather than, say, a prison or fortress? So, to me, because... So, a prison or a fortress is a beacon that most people would see and say, okay, I can break in there. I can do this. A maze invites people to try. And in doing so, repels more, I think. So to me, someone who builds a maze, probably also going to be more eccentric. And there's nothing that says that the maze can't be attached to or in front of the prison or the fortress. So to me, you know, don't forget, there are people out there that are crazy, man. And they are just like, you know what? Build me a maze. The Mad King. Maze of the Mad King. There's the encounter name. The Mad King commissioned a maze be built. And he had heroes go through it for sport. And, you know, similar to the Minotaur, you know, myth. And that's why. Because people are eccentric and interesting. And uh, But in addition, like I said... I think a fortress is like, all right, let's plan a heist. But people don't plan heists for mazes. They're like, nah, stay away. We can get lost in there and die. It's very hard to plan breaking into a maze or getting through a maze. It's more like you don't know what you're getting into until you get in there. And even then, who knows? It could change. It could shift. You know. So I don't know. That's just some thought processes I have about that question. Chris Willem. Rob, I'm still waiting for Gariel's, oh, Garail's Sea Jack campaign waiting for it too um so i think this will about do it for mazes feel free to comment here i'm going to put this one on youtube it'll probably be up tomorrow um no chris i know he's chris Wilhelm says the minotaur myth is actually about a cheating wife not a mad king no no i know that but i mean um having heroes placed into the maze on purpose um is what i meant that part of the myth so in this in this myth the mad king would be my kind of reskinning of that mythos to say this mad king put multiple heroes at multiple starting points for fun and profit no maybe to get a macguffin in the middle or how crazy is this what if he put four heroes at different portions and he hid this is where the back doors and stuff could come from as well like the the paths he hid their family members in there one family member each and Whoever found their family member first got to live and leave, but the rest, the maze was sealed off, and they had to survive in there with the Minotaur or something crazy. I don't even know, uh, but I'm pulling into my driveway here. I'm going to go eat some family dinner, um, but yeah, I'm loving this stuff, guys. Keep your eyes peeled for a Dragon Grin adventure kit that's based on the Maze of the Mad King. Uh, I think that could be pretty rad. Um, what uh, I'd love to know what region you'd like to see that in, because I kind of want to explore different parts of... Uh, of Dragon Grin. Um, so yeah, maybe tell me what region you think that should be in. One final question, Sean Murphy, off topic. Can we get a video slash stream on time travel? Sure. I have all kinds of ideas about time travel. I wrote a time travel pulp comic uh, for six years that never saw the light of day, and most of it is miserable and awful, so not good enough to share. Uh, but this, it was Chase Fortune. And uh, the concept was good, but the idea was um, that, long story short, a pulp hero sort of gets pushed through time to modern day. Uh, But it would have two concurrent comic books going at once, one in the pulp era uh, and then one in the modern day. But yeah, I have plenty of ideas on time travel that I think would be pretty rad. So yeah, I'll definitely do that. Maybe I can do that. I don't typically do um, daily damages on the weekends. So maybe that'll be Monday's topic. Oh, Chris Wilhelm says Rykogen. That would be Rodimus. Dude, yes, done. That's it. It's a an Asian-themed maze. Oh, Chris. I'm going to pick your brain on what monster should be in there. The Macronomicon. I just made potato salad. Good for you. Sean Murphy says, yay! So... When will then be now? 
Chris says, I can help you if you want. Dude, I'll, I'll shoot you some ideas. We'll definitely uh, get together on that. I have some concepts. One of the things we're trying to do is make these so that they take place in Dragon Grin, but that they're not so steeped in the Dragon Grin lore that you need to know a ton about Dragon Grin to run them because the other key is keeping them super lean. I want it so that someone could download this PDF and just run the game. It's like a hot sheet. You don't have to read tons of adventure background and all this other stuff, which is great. And modules are special to me. But this is more like, hey, you guys want to run a one shot? Let's do Maze of the Mad King. Boom, you download it. There's a quick description. There's a quick section that says where they begin. There's a quick section that says where they'll end up. Kind of like, hey, have your ending in mind. Then you flip the page and it's seriously five different short encounters where it's like, you know, uh, the ghost of the maze would be like a role play encounter. It's just quick ideas like here's boom, boom, boom. And it has five of those kind of representing the five room dungeon. Then you flip the page and then it's like the locations. Now here's what the locations would be. Just quick bullet points. So it says, you know, say um, the dead king's throne. And it'll say it'll have very short gray box text and then bullet points of things that might be in this area. The Grey King's, th or you know, the, yeah, the Grey, we'll call it the Grey King's Throne. The Grey King's Throne uh, looks like this, might have some stuff like this. This would be a good place for traps, this, you know, that kind of thing. Just very quick bulleted stuff so that you could flip through and then just run this thing. And you can choose what order and what you put where and all that stuff. In addition to that, you can also, um, there's something at the end to, it's a very, very, very basic um, monster generator and trap generator. When I say basic, it's like, hey, if you want the monster to be challenge rating, you know, this to this for players one through four, give them roughly this many hit points and have them hit for roughly this much. So you can also make up monsters on the fly. That's it. That's the whole book. Um, and it's, yeah, so it's maybe five, seven pages, but you could get it. It's thematic and you could run it. So that's the idea. Anyway. My daughter's here. Evie, you want to come and be on the internet? Come here. Hey. <laughs> All right, say hi. Say hi, everybody. This is Evie. She's writing all our modules. She's writing all our adventures. Evie, you writing all Daddy's adventures? She is. Um, anyway, I'm going to play with my daughter and have fun with my family. Whoa. I better go be a parent. Love you all, and until next time. <laughs> Make your dice roll.